listen to the vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes, and I'm very privileged to have an author here with me, Mr. Matt Bechtel, and we're going to learn a little bit about him and talk about his book. And talking with him before we got started, uh, we kind of have something in common, so uh, we're going to we're going to reveal that later. But uh, Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. It's weird to be called an author. Uh, you know, this book just came out, so that's all fresh to me. And by the way, I really enjoyed your uh, interviews with Bo Roberts and uh, oh. Hugh Newman. I have okay. uh, some theories on giants myself. But uh, yeah, at, at a glance, um, I'm the youngest elected official in Nebraska. Um, I ran for city council in my town of Fremont when I was 19. Uh, I lost that race by 48 votes ran again next time I could, and I got elected at 22. Um, did a four-year term, took a peek in the political world, realized I didn't want anything to do with it, got out, started uh, focusing on creativity stuff. So since I've been off the council, um, I put out a hard rock album with my band, Always Tyrants, um, started the book Brilliant Podcast, where I talk to people about book recommendations and stuff. Um, dabbled into acting. I'm actually shooting a short film this weekend where I play a cowboy, which is why I've got the uh, facial hair and the longer hair. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> and then uh, most recently, yeah, just put out this fictional book on sleep paralysis called sleep. Cool. Did you ever watch the show uh, uh, parks and rec? Oh yeah. Yeah. M remember the one character he had run for mayor of his town and he was real young, but he kind of screwed it up. <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, people used to talk like joke with me about that all the time, actually. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar. And I, I was always afraid to be that guy, too. You know, um, yeah. it's an intimidating thing. But uh, but like I said, um, took a peek into that world, realized I didn't really want to stay there. And uh, I thought, you know what, doing artistic stuff, you can really be yourself. And the more that you're yourself, people don't judge you. People don't tell you, hey, you might want to cut your hair if you want to win this race. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 been a, it's been a blast. Uh, but it's, you know, an interesting story nonetheless. Yeah. It's given me a lot of, um, like, I really analyze stuff. Um, I played paintball a couple of weeks ago for the first time. And I was, you know, sitting there on the drive home. I'm just thinking about everything and thinking about how people react to certain situations. I mean, everything I do. And so when I was on the city council, I got to really see what people are like when they're stressed out or, mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when they're in, in, in a situation they've never thought they'd be in, you know, um, good or bad, whatever. Um, I really took that to, to heart. And so I, I hope that it helps with my writing. Um, you know, the more you can do a lot of stuff, but if you're not taking it in and thinking about it and talking about it to people and, you know, then, then it's, you're kind of wasting the experience. Yeah. I'm glad you got out of politics. I used to <laughs> be in public works and being a supervisor, you kind of see how all that po politics goes and it's, uh, it's nasty. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. And it's probably going to get worse for a while, too. So it's a good time to not be in it. So, <laughs> yeah. man, we could do a podcast just on that. <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So you're in a metal band, huh? I'm in a hard rock band. Yeah, I'm in a oh, okay. I'm in a hard rock band called Always Tyrants. Um, people have said we sound like a mix of Motley Crue and Nirvana. I don't mm -hmm. know what that sounds like, but that was a really cool um and then one time somebody said we sound like a mixture of red hot chili peppers and black sabbath which again is uh, a really cool thing i don't know if it's true um but uh, i appreciate hearing comments like that <laughs> man that it's got to sound awesome i gotta hear you are y'all on spotify oh yeah yeah okay. our uh, our debut album was called these days um you know you can you can definitely check that out that came in early 2021 like february 2021 we got music videos and all that stuff out there so you can definitely see it <laughs> and you got to send me all the links so i can share them in the description because i'm sure somebody out there is going to be interested in, in hearing the music 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, alwaystyrants.com. We're on all social media, but if you go to the website, you'll find it all. But I'll definitely kick over the links to you. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah, man, definitely. I, I love supporting music. And, and uh, real quick, kind of stay along that line. I, I just interviewed this lady named Sally Steele. Okay. She has a, uh, a hard rock uh, magazine called Vegas Rocks. And okay. she, she interviews everybody. I mean, you know, Motley Crue and Alice Cooper and all these guys. I think you'll enjoy it. It just came out today. So check it out if you get a chance. I will. You know what? Alice Cooper is a hard interview to get. On my podcast, Book Brilliant, I've interviewed people from Buck Cherry, Nickelback, Everclear, Wheatus. And wow. um, one of the agents that I worked with who has given me great access to a lot of people, Alice Cooper is on her as, as under their PR agency. And she basically told me like, nah, you can't interview Alice. He's like, uh, he doesn't do interviews. <laughs> so props <laughs> to her. That's, that's impressive. And, but I, I heard that he's a, a really laid back, easygoing guy, very humble. So, oh yeah. You know, may, maybe yeah. one day, maybe. Well, maybe I worked with a guy that used to sell Callaway golf clubs Mm -hmm. so everybody wanted to be this guy's friend and he actually uh golfed with alice cooper and got to go behind the scenes when alice um and motley crew came through omaha which i was actually at that show um but he said the same thing he said alice was uh just a normal dude pretty much <laughs> uh, we could do a podcast about him too <laughs> oh for sure yeah i like that guy a lot actually so uh, let's get into your book now, you, you said that uh, it's about sleep paralysis. Uh, did you yes. study sleep paralysis or did you have an experience or what, what inspired that? Yeah, pretty much all of that. So since I, I remember as a kid, I would have dreams where you woke up in your dream and you thought that you were still, um, you know, you thought that you were actually awake when you weren't, right? And that's terrifying. And I would have occasionally where, um, I thought I was awake and people were breaking into my house, but I couldn't move. And, um, you know, lo and behold, that's actually kind of a minor version of sleep paralysis itself. Um, but, you know, I kind of talk about it in the book and I, I don't want to share his story completely, but my brother had it pretty bad. And um, I, f I felt bad for him because I felt like a lot of people weren't taking it seriously and just thought like, oh, geez, you know, well, what's this guy talking about? You know, seeing things at night like this guy needs medication or something. And, and I believed him and started looking into it. And um, I don't know what it was, uh, to be honest. I, I really didn't even want to write the book. Um, I was convinced that if I did write the book, I would get, you know, really bad spiritual attacks or something. So I, I really didn't want to write the book, but I just thought of the story of, you know, what if you took somebody who, and you, and you, you know, I feel bad for the poor character because you just give him the worst scenario possible. He's this atheist metalhead kid. He doesn't believe in anything. He doesn't really believe in anything he can't see. And he doesn't think about it either. He's just kind of living in the moment and he's got no family. Um, he's got a couple of buddies, but that's about it. And he starts having sleep paralysis and he doesn't, he doesn't know what it is. He's never heard the term sleep paralysis and he's massively suffering from it. And what kind of compounds it is that he doesn't understand it. And he feels like he can't tell people about it because he thinks he's just going crazy. So I put him in this horrible spot. I also give him like the worst sleep paralysis you could have. Um, there's kind of different degrees of it. Everything I wrote, I believe to be possible, but it, it, what he's experiencing would be very rare. A lot of the people who have it, um, they'll see different entities. They'll see the hat man. They'll see shadow people. They'll see incubus or succubus um, or, or none of that. It'll just be kind of what I had where you wake up and you can't move type of a thing. Um, and so, and another thing too, a lot of people, they may have it a couple of times and that's it. But with him, he's getting it pretty much nonstop throughout the book. Um, but the more that I thought about the story, I was compelled to write it. I actually called up my pastor and was kind of hoping he would talk me out of writing it. And he was like, no, sounds like you could do a good job with it. And, you know, kind of gave me a couple pointers to it and, and off I went. So that's kind of the origins of the book. <laughs> you know, I can imagine people that listen to, to my show or they're watching this on YouTube. They, they probably think, man, that guy, everything happens to him. 
<laughs> but I, I've had that happen a couple of times and it's so weird because yeah. you, you do, you're kind of in between awake and asleep and yeah. then you try to scream or try to move and you can't do anything. It's, it's trippy, man. Really trippy. Yeah. Have you ever had like, and I think, I don't think this is sleep process related. I just think it's normal, but like, you know how, when you try to run in a dream and you're really slow, <laughs> yeah. I, I did. I hate that so much. I, there was a time in my life where I was actually convinced I was a slow runner because I would dream about running so much and being slow. And I remember one time I took off on a sprint and I was like, oh yeah, that was, I, I can run, <laughs> but yeah, that's, literally that's probably my least favorite thing actually is trying to run in a dream but yeah <laughs> oh god yeah you can hardly move or you're trying to get away from somewhere and it's just you go through one path to another and you still can't get out of wherever you're at and then lately i've been having this one where i'm trying to throw a, a football or a baseball oh yeah I, I can't do it Oh, I don't think I've had that. I've had like trying to fight people and then your punches are like pulled back. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That, that's another one that, that uh, drives me nuts, but I will, I'll, I'll say, you know, um, what was really weird with writing this was like, there was one night, I mean, I read, I interviewed people like either on the phone or, or like, you know, ask people direct questions about it. But I also read a lot of testimonies and stuff. Um, whether it was like in books, there was some like, um, scholarly type books about sleep paralysis that I read that had testimonies in there. Um, and then I read like just people on Facebook and also some documentaries or, or videos of people talking about it on video. And there are people who I think kind of BS it a little bit, but you try to figure out what's common and what's not and stuff. And so um, there was one night, I mean, I, it, well, not even a night, probably a few nights where right before I went to bed, all, all I was doing was reading these interviews, you know, these, these testimonies and stuff. And then I'd go to bed and I would have dreams. I didn't have sleep paralysis, but I had dreams about sleep paralysis. It was really weird. It was weird. <laughs> so, so I don't know, but I didn't, I didn't, um, I don't know. I could definitely go into, if you want me to talk about, you know, maybe spiritual type attacks that I have had, but th the weirdest thing was, was during the course of writing this book, I really didn't have any, which I'm, I'm still kind of like waiting for something to happen. <laughs> you know, so. it seems that you get attacked the worst when you're trying to do your best. Yes. 100%. Yeah. It's, that, that's it. The devil, when he wants to come after you, if you're, if you're just going about your day and you're not really trying to live for God, he yeah. did, he's not going to mess with you. But as soon as you start putting your focus on God, that's when you get the most attacks. Yeah. What 100% um, that you, you, you know, it perfectly there. I mean, um, anytime that I would talk to somebody about God or try to help somebody's life turn around, you know, it would be like that night, something weird would happen. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm the kind of guy that at like at 3 PM, you know, right about this time in the day, like, I want to see a demon. I want to see one in person. I want to see what it's like. But then by nine o'clock at night, I'm like, God, I was kidding. Please don't. <laughs> like, you well, know, I, I, the thought is terrifying. And, you know, I'll say that, like, I interviewed people, like, not just, not, not just people who had like sleep paralysis, but I would talk to people who have seen, who have seen demons and things. And, and um, one of the things that I kind of learned about it was like, it seems like it's so invasive. It's really not something people want to talk about. You know, people probably aren't going to, if someone was sexually abused, they're probably not just going to walk around telling people that. Right. And it, it's almost like the same thing with, with people who have seen a demon. Like I talk to people who they don't even want to tell, you know, other members of their church. And, and I'm the complete opposite. I go in front of my church and I tell everybody everything that I've seen. Like I'm an open book on that. And I kind of grew up in a church that, I wouldn't consider it really, it was a little bit charismatic, but I think they're just open about what experiences they had. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of that way to this day, you know, um, there was a, uh, the first time I ever preached a sermon, I'm not a full-time pastor, but I, I preach occasionally. And the first time I ever did, um, you know, I sit down at night and I'm working on my sermon and my son was two or three at the time. And he said, he starts crying in his room. And I go into his room and I said, what's wrong? And he said, I don't like that noise. And I'm thinking it's the neighbor's dog. So I'm like, 
go back to sleep, you know, whatever, and kind of cries again. And the second time I went in there, I started to feel a little bit weird. Um, it's like, okay, okay this is kind of odd. Well, the third time he woke up, he was screaming and saying there's a black monster in his room, which he's never done that before. There's nothing that he could have seen or watched that would have given him that in his imagination, right? And I mean, I about kicked the door and run into his room. And, you know, my wife and I, I read some Bible verses, we prayed. And then my, my baby at the time, you know, not even a year old, he started crying. And to him, it's, it was like he was scared, you know? And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out what to do. And I realized it's all a distraction. And I've mm -hmm. talked to other pastors about it and they've said, you know, it's all parlor tricks. That's what it is. It's, it's, it's a distraction. It's either trying to scare you from doing something good or it's just trying to waste your time. So you can't, you know what I mean? You deal with that for an hour and then you go to write your sermon again. And it's like, yeah, it's midnight. I'm, I'm I'll do it tomorrow. You know? So I, I started to chalk up a lot of things to parlor tricks more than I do you know, some crazy wild encounter, power encounter with evil, you know? Yeah. And you also find that when you start helping people, then bad things will start happening to you. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I get it. Like you said, it's a distraction. Yeah. But, you know, it's, and I, I know it's the devil trying to discourage you from helping others, but, you know, you think, I'm helping people. Why is all this bad stuff happening to me? Yeah. It, it, it's all part of, of uh, I don't know, I guess your, your training to be a, you know, a warrior for Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know. I mean, even, even Paul in the Bible, you know, they talk about him having a thorn in his side. Um, I, I, I'm definitely curious to know, like, uh, here's the problem with like a lot of people that talk about demons is like a lot of them are just weird people right so like you talk to them like even if you weren't talking about that you'd think like this guy's a little bit goofy and people tend to give it a little bit more power than it deserves I think Erwin Lutzer was the he wrote a book called God's Devil and I highly recommend it because in it you realize like God and Satan aren't having a chess match like Satan is still God's servant. You know, you look in the book of Job, he had to ask God for permission to do anything, right? So yep. um, I think that we can chalk, we can give him a little bit too much power. And like, I like the book, The Exorcist. I would say that if I had to compare this book to any book, I would say it's probably The Exorcist-like, if that makes sense. Uh, but, <laughs> but it's kind of like The, the Exorcist. But I, I, if you've ever read the book, The Exorcist, I absolutely hate I absolutely hate the ending to it. It makes me roll my eyes. Um, I think they give way too much power to darkness. Not that the powers of darkness should be minimalized. They should be respected. Even in the Bible, you see angels respect, you know, respect the, the enemy. Um, but I think that we don't do it. We're not doing it right if we, you know, act like, you know, they've really got God's bell rung or whatever. I, I just don't believe that, you know. So, um, but what I was going to say was i'd be very curious like to talk to paul or them about jesus or about um demons would be <laughs> would be interesting because some of the people that have like ministry stories have like they're actually like really funny like it's, it's some of the stories aren't scary at all like they're actually kind of humorous so I, that would be an interesting conversation <laughs> well we sometimes give power to things that don't deserve it and yeah. that goes with people as well you know, when yeah. you're when you're trying to do the right thing and somebody comes out and will will cut you down and, and you, you worry about that kind of stuff, that's giving them undue power because yeah. they, they have no power unless you give it to them. Yeah. Uh, just like on social media, you know, you, you try to post something positive and I'm just about going to guarantee you 99.9% .9 of the time somebody's going to put something negative on there and yeah you can't give them the power you just okay whatever yeah yeah it's kind of the same reasons why you can't talk about politics stuff i this is how i view any of that stuff is like you and i can have a disagreement on politics as long as we both understand that i'm trying to figure out what's best for other people and you're mm -hmm. trying to figure out what's best for other people if we can believe in our hearts that you're really just trying to figure out what's best and that that's what I'm trying to do, but we're just having a disagreement on how to get there. Same thing with being on city council. You know, if you believe what you're saying is what's best for the city and I believe it, 
Yeah. Okay, we don't have to get nasty with each other. We can just say, okay, this is what makes me think this is how this will work best. And then you tell me that and we can figure out, you know, where we can uh, meet in the middle. Um, but anymore, it's, 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 um, you know, people don't do that. They want to name call and whatever. And, and it's, it's a lot harder to have a conversation and sit down and think it, think it through. But um, again, if you can just believe in your heart um, that your opponent you know, really is just looking is they think they're doing what's right. I mean, even Marcus really talks about that. He says, you know, pretty much people are, are only trying to do what they think is right. Mm -hmm. You know, but, uh, so <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But the crazy thing is, is there's a small percentage of people that are on, say, like Twitter. Yeah. And they seem to shout the loudest. And yeah. as a as a, a, a whole, we have given them so much power that you even can go out in public and you don't know if they're one of those people that are on Twitter doing all the, the chattering. So you're afraid to talk to people about what you believe in, in that kind of stuff. And that, that's, that's sad. We used to be able to sit down and have a discussion and now it's, it's almost like us against them. And I, I don't yeah. like it being that way, but unfortunately that's the direction we've gone in. Yeah, for sure. I, I tell you what, man, I even I had a guy once email me on city council and like he sent me this email that like I almost cried reading it. I mean, he he hit every insecurity I had with a hammer. You know, it's almost like he knew what my deepest insecurities were. And he slammed into them. And and, um, you know, you get thicker skin over time, but still some people can break through. But mm -hmm. it's what what you said. This isn't direct, directly correlated, but you said something that reminded me. I was interviewing the bassist from Nickelback, uh, Mike, and I was telling him uh, what I was trying to say was like being on city council is weird because when you're out in public, you don't know who knows you. You know, and I said, I would think that that's kind of like what it'd be like in a, in a rock band, too. When you're out in public, you don't know if somebody knows you or not. And that's mm -hmm. just a weird feeling. And I and I said, it makes you feel kind of exposed. And somebody on Twitter came and was like, you being on your small town city council is not the same as being in Nickelback. And it's like, OK, I know that I'm very aware that I'm not a member of Nickelback. <laughs> uh, you know, you're talking about your community. Yeah, I'm just trying to, uh, I'm just trying to say like it, 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 I was, and I stick to that. Like, it's weird if you could be a real estate agent and have your name, you know, have your face all over a billboard. It'd be weird if you're, you know, at Walmart and you don't know if the people there know you or not. It's just, all I'm saying is it's weird. It is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's funny that you, you mentioned that because the other day I got a, uh, a message from someone and basically, uh, called me uh, and I'm, I'm trying to be clean about this because you know it was not a very nice term but basically doing oral on a a, a, a rooster <laughs> oh wow yeah 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 you know you know what i'm trying to say <laughs> yeah you know, and and here i am trying to put out positive stuff it's and, crazy and i even I, I put out uh, they, they make us do these little, boy, they don't make us, but they suggest we do these little short videos on YouTube to try to compete with TikTok. Yeah. And so I put one up and all this guy said was just positive things. There was nothing political, religious, it, nothing. It was just yeah. positive stuff. And I got negative feedback <laughs> for it. And I think, what? Why? Yeah. So you wonder who's watching you. And if you go out in public, if this person already knew you and that's why they were doing it, you know, are you going to get attacked because people see you on YouTube? I mean, I'm, I don't have, you know, million subscribers or anything, but yeah. you still, you don't know. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, uh, one time I used to do police ride alongs cause I would try to, you know, just trying to understand what the, what the city needs and stuff. So I would try to do these police ride alongs. And I had a cop who told me once, you know, uh, we were just talking and he was talking about, I mean, just talk about like people who get verbally abused, you know, a lot of cops, a lot of cops do. And he was saying, you know, one piece of advice I've learned is, you know, don't take criticism from somebody you wouldn't ask advice from. And that is a good point, but yeah. still like I'll have people who will say stuff to me every now and then. And like, it's true. I wouldn't ask this person for advice, but it still bothers you. And I, they, you know, there's so many studies about the brain that show like, 
you're always going to pick out the, if there's a hundred comments, the one that's going to stick with you is the one that's negative, you know, 99 are positive, one's negative, but that's just how, you know, humans have, I guess, evolved over time. Um, and so uh, that, that's just the way we're built. And I feel like over time and experience, you know, you get better at it, but, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we, I, yeah, I get it. That's like, they say the one bad apple can ruin the whole bunch. Yeah. That's exactly what happens. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, let's, let's kind of um, focus on uh, not only the book, but the, yeah. the, the hurdles that you've had to overcome, whether, well, well let's say in your music and in writing that uh, somebody else could probably learn from, maybe get some inspiration from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, the biggest thing with me was that I would call it a mindset that I always thought I was going to get saved, right? Mm -hmm. I always thought I was going to get a record deal and I was going to get saved. I always thought whatever I did was going to be at the highest level. You know, I put off putting an album out because I thought, no, I'm, I'm going to be signed to a label and that's how I'm going to put out my first album. And you start to realize over time you're not getting saved. And um, so I think for one, you just got to do it. Um, and you have to do it for you. And that's harder to understand when you're younger, because when you're young, you only want to be in a band for money and chicks. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and if anybody wanted to, if anyone's like in high school and they want to be in a band and it's not for money and chicks, I don't want to hang out with that guy. Uh, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, um, you know, um, our, I don't think as humans, our motivations will never be completely pure, but um, you know, you, you have to, uh, you just got to do it. And one person who I've, I'll consider him a friend. He may not consider me a friend and that's okay. But as David Gunn from uh, the band King 810, um, I interviewed him for book, for book brilliant and, um, we've stayed in touch and I listen to a lot of what he says in the interviews and just things that we've talked about. And one thing I learned from him, um, was that he basically said, I feel the same way about the song that I just released that I do about these 99 songs that are in my hard drive right here that I haven't released yet. Mm. And that was really mind altering to me because I wanted the praise. I've always wanted the praise. If I released a song, I wanted people to tell me it was the next stairway to heaven and sweet, you know, uh, welcome to the jungle and whatever, you know, I've always wanted that. And what I realized was I had to start the art that I made, I had to make it for me first. Yeah. And it sounds kind of selfish, but it's kind of not. Um, when I do it, you, there's certain amounts of, of, you know, you have to tweak it and, and try to make, like the, I got the cover of the book behind me, right? I paid a bunch of money for that book cover. And I had the artist, I wanted it to be, to model the old like horror movies that you'd see a blockbuster on VHS tape. The book, I actually measured a VHS tape and I made the book that exact size. Oh, wow. I did that for, I, I did that for me. Um, I had some people look at the cover and say they didn't like it. And it bothered me to be honest that, it, that they didn't like it. But then other people were like, whoa, that's a really cool cover. But I just had to ask myself, why did I have the cover made the way I did? I, I made it, I wanted it to be that way for me. You know, I didn't go to a publisher for a variety of reasons. But two of the reasons were was because I knew that it was it was a it was going to be too too Christian for a secular audience and, and too uh, secular for a Christian audience, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, that there was that, and I also didn't really want to have someone tell me what was good or not. I had people that I trusted who read the book, and they would tell me, "Hey, you're maybe off a little bit here, or you know something's missing." And I would take it and I'd think about it, and then I would adjust it. Um, so there is tweaking in that, you know, I did three rounds of editing with it. I, there was a lot of editing, more editing than there was writing. And some of the stuff I changed in editing, like I knew what I was trying to say, but I realized like, you know, a general audience may not. So I had to tweak it. So there's a little bit of tweaking you're going to have to do along the way, but ultimately you have to do it for you. You mm -hmm. know, if, if you're, I always kind of despise the kids. And even when I was in high school, like the kids that only did what their parents wanted, I think it's, I think it's a good thing for kids to listen to their parents. But, you know, if you're putting yourself through school or, or you're playing in the sports or music or whatever, and you don't really want to do it, you know, but your dad's making you, you gotta, <laughs> I've always stand up to your dad, man. And some people will live their whole life and they can't tell their parents, no, you know what I mean? And that to me is, is crazy. 
Um, so I think that you have to learn to have the confidence to, um, you know, create for yourself first. So that was the, that's one of the biggest things um, that I've overcome, you know, honestly, in the last two to three years. When um, they, uh, these uh, filmmakers and, and musicians, and we can go on and on and on, they get into that mainstream where they have the, the corporates telling them this is the way it needs to sound or this is the way it needs to look. You need to have this in it. You need to have that in it. We can go on and on and on. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, it's so uh, robotic. It's so, uh, I don't know how else to describe it, but it's just, it, it's not real art. Yeah. It's like, I don't, I don't enjoy movies anymore because they seem to have the same formula over and over and over again. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, you know, they try to push messages and stuff in there that I don't I, I, I don't want to hear it. I just want to have entertainment. Yeah, it's it's driving people away. You know, I, I yeah. had this conversation with a couple of filmmakers that you know, people are falling out of love with Hollywood. Yeah, I'll absolutely. say that over and over again. And you've you've got the actors that are turning on their audience because they don't like something. Yeah. You know, they're, they're preaching at them instead of trying to em embrace their audience and bring their audience in to enjoy whatever it is they're doing. Yeah. So we're looking for the, the independence. You know, so since you didn't go through the publishers and all the other stuff to do what you're doing, that you're an independent artist. Yeah. And I think that's going to be the wave of the future. We're getting away from the mainstream crap. We're sick of it. Give yeah. me entertainment. You know, I don't, I don't mind if you have a good value message, you know, uh, be kind to others or, you know, make your bed up when mama tells you to, <laughs> whatever, yeah, I mean, you know, that that's fine. As long as it's subtle, it's not in your face, which yeah. is what they're doing in Hollywood. That's what they're doing with the record companies. Yeah. I don't, I don't enjoy a lot of the bands that I, I've listened to for years because they've gotten into this corporate machine and then everything sounds the same. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, I, I won't name them, but there was a uh, band that has definitely risen. Um, you know, that they're a more popular band of young guys. And I was kind of thinking that, that, you know, they're cool dudes or whatever. And, then I was reading this interview about their first album and they're like, we kind of scrapped all of our original stuff and we decided to write an album about this political topic. And I was like, Oh, Oh, wow. You're brave. You know what? No one's done this before. It's like, uh -huh. come on, man. you know, and, and you see it with people, you'll see it with, with people who, you know, they start off like that and they start off as, um, or they start off independent. And then as they get success, they keep, spouting the same narrative because they want to be accepted for that and mm -hmm. um I, he, here's the truth of the matter is too it's really hard to sit on principle um I, I don't like talking about city council i've talked about it way too much already in this interview even but i've learned what it's like to sit in a room of people who are angry with you because you're going to tell them no or you're going to say yes to something and you're doing it out of principle and they don't like it it's mm -hmm. something that most people can't and don't do. And so I understand, I, I really understand like how hard that is. And I get why most people do it, like why they can't, why they can't do it. You know what I mean? I mean, look at the people who are being creative right now. Um, again, like some people may know about David Gunn and King 810, others don't, but people call them the most hated band in America. And it's ridiculous. If, if you actually look at, if you read the lyrics, um, yeah, they're pretty crazy, like violent lyrics or whatever on some of the songs. But to me, he's the most original and he's the most creative artist right now doing it. And that's why, um, you know, I've enjoyed, you know, the friendship that I've, that I've, uh, you know, started to have with him. And, and I look for that in other artists and writers, you know, um, you know, who is the most original thinker, who's, who's taking real risks, you know, because a lot of the time, if, if the media is telling you like, wow, you're so brave and you're taking a risk, you're probably not. Because if you were taking a risk, that's not what, how the media would be spinning it. They would just be attacking you. So it's, yeah, it's a weird time, man. And movies used to take a risk and now yeah. they don't. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And you know what though, part of that I feel like is just from an investment standpoint. So like I've kind of always hammered movies too, but now that I've like 
you know, tr have a little bit more experience with it. And I've written some scripts I'm trying to get made. Um, you know, I kind of get it to some extent because it's a business, you know, it's, you know, how are we going to get the money back? Well, you put Iron Man in a movie, you're getting your money back. You know what I mean? So I get, I, I can understand how it happens. It doesn't mean I agree with it or that I like it, but I understand why, you know, going to the movies anymore, like you're only going to go to the movie if it's a Top Gun if it's, you know, where, where yeah. it's like, it's really going to be a big difference. Otherwise, you're just going to watch it at your house. So I kind of get like where it's coming from. I don't like the political, how everything has just become political. Um, nobody wants to be lectured. You know, I'm in, I'm in middle America. Um, you're in tech, you know, you don't, sometimes you just watch this and you're like, do the, do the people who live on the coast just think like I'm stupid or like, I don't know how to <laughs> read or you know what I mean? So yeah. So I, I do get it to some extent. Um, I try not to hold it against people, but there's definitely times where you have to roll your eyes like, oh, wow. Yeah. You're, you're brave. Wow. You know? Yeah. So. Well, you know, I, I do um, get into politics sometimes, but it's outside of what I'm doing here. Yeah. Uh, you know, simply because I care. Yeah. And I, I, I don't mind being friends with somebody who has an opposite view from me. And I have a few friends that are like that. But for the most part, people don't want to have anything to do with you if you don't see it their way. Yeah. But when I'm wanting to be entertained, that's my time to get away from all this garbage. You know, yeah. I, world news, whatever wars going on, what the economy is. I want to escape from it for a while and just, you know, enjoy myself. Sports started getting political. Yeah. And, I mean, football, I've, I've watched football since I was probably five years old. That's when yeah. I kind of knew what it was. And I never missed a game for all yeah. these decades. And for the last few years, I quit watching. Yeah. And it's sad, man. I, I That was something I really enjoyed. And now I can't because I got some – sportscaster on there who wants to preach to me dude just tell me who who fumbled the ball who who made the tackle who who just got that penalty i don't yeah. i don't care what their politics are well yeah i mean that's it, it's weird i mean everybody's become a commentator now with with social media and stuff like that um everybody has a platform everybody wants to be famous mm -hmm. i don't think like i don't think human nature changes that much like i don't I, like, I think that if you put people from 200 years ago and you gave them an iPhone, you know, it, it wouldn't be immediate, but I'm sure within 10 to 20 years, they'd be acting like fools too. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I just don't think that we're that, you know, we're, we're that unique or whatever, but um, yeah, I don't know. It, I, I definitely agree. You know, when you want to watch a sport, you want to watch a sport. Um, yep. You know, yep. when you want to read a book, you want to read a book. Mm -hmm. Um I don't, one of the things like I did with this book too, by the way, is like, I wrote about stuff that like, I didn't agree with, but I still try to do research to make sure that I was putting it in its most accurate light. Mm -hmm. um, there was a part where he goes to a uh, metaphysical shop and the character is trying to figure out what do I do with the sleep paralysis? And I, I don't really buy into the crystals or anything like that. I, I'm not, I don't believe in that stuff. Right. So I, what I did though, was I called up every metaphysical shop in my area and, and I even called some in other states and I just said, hey, I have sleep paralysis. What do you recommend I do? And I wrote down what they said. I took them serious. Okay. And I used that for the book because I didn't want somebody to read that and say like, you know, you're making fun of me. You're making fun of mm -hmm. my beliefs. I, was, I wasn't trying to do that. I was trying to, I was trying to propose it as accurate as I could. Um, in this book, this character is a huge metalhead. And um, probably the most inaccurate part of the book is how wide his taste in metal is because a lot of metalheads, they consider themselves like elitists where they only listen to their subgenre. So that's probably the most like unrealistic aspect of the book. <laughs> um, but again, like I put, um, and I need to remind myself, I was going to make a Spotify playlist because I, I, I wrote out, you know, all the titles of these books that he, um, you know, or all these songs that he listened to. I need to make a note of that right now. Um, but I write out, you know, this is the song he was listening to, you know, these are the lyrics of the song. And I wasn't trying to, you know, 
like lecture anybody about, you know, whether he should or should not be listening to the music. I, I really wasn't. I was just trying to portray what would a metalhead listen to and why, and why was he listening to it? And some of it was, you know, and, and I listened to a wide range of music, including metal. And so I can relate to the character and like in this mood, he listened to this song and this is why, you know, same thing. I wanted to just portray it accurately. And so um, if somebody reads this book, I, I really would hope that they don't feel like, um, like that, like I'm, I'm trying to slam in values or whatever. To me, it was just, it was just a uh, trying to portray the story as accurate as I could. It was necessary to the story. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I'm, I'm going to add one more point and then I'm going to drop the subject. But, you know, I don't even want to hear them tell me even if I agree with them. Yeah. During that stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I don't. Oh, yeah. It's like, do you ever have where you're like listening to somebody and you're like, this person's right, but for the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like one of those things where it's like, dang, man, I would, I would, I actually, it's funny. I used, I used to work for a Budweiser wholesaler and um, I trained this kid and we had polar opposite political views and we spent the whole week together. And I said, could you tell, could you tell me which political party I'm in? And he said, no, I don't think I could. Because what we did was, you know, it was one of those things where we just found where we had common ground and uh, we just stuck to that. And it's the same thing. Sometimes you're like listening to a guy and you're like, okay, yeah, I'm tracking, I'm tracking. And then I'll say something and you're like, whoa, okay, let's uh, get up, <laughs> you know? So, well, yeah. There was a time when everybody tried to find common ground, especially yeah. when you enjoyed, you know, music or uh, sports, you know, I, I, I could be... Uh, I don't know, you could be sitting next to a white collar guy and a blue collar guy at a football game and you found common ground with the game, with the team, yeah. what have you. And that that's the way we live. I said I wasn't going to talk about this anymore. <laughs> no, it's, uh, hey, I can't you, help you it. Know, you want to should we should we tell everybody the Easter egg of what we have in common? Oh, yes. We need to get to that point, too, before before it's all over. But I'm going to let you tell the story. Yeah. So um, you want me to tell about the Texas thing? Yes, definitely. Cool, cool. cool. So, uh, well, what, what, you know, Kyle and I found out, you know, before the cameras were rolling, we're talking about Texas. And I said, the only time I was in Texas was in Huntsville um, when I was four years old. My grandma was a nurse there for the, uh, at, at the prison there. And my uh, grandpa, uh, well, he was my step grandpa, you could say, um, he, he was a uh, maintenance guy at that Huntsville prison. And the Huntsville prison has always been fascinating to me because my grandma worked there and because they execute the most prisoners anywhere yep. in the United States. And so even when I was a kid, I, I remember like when I first got YouTube, I would watch like episodes of Locked Up and stuff that people would like pirate and put on there. Uh, <laughs> but any, and I've watched a bunch of documentaries about that place. But anyway, in the book, um, I actually use my grandparents uh, real name for the grandparents for this character and some of the stories about the character, some of them, not, not all of them. There's some pretty wild stuff that I, that I go through or that, that happened to his grandparents and, and they're not true, but there are some good memories in there that I put in there. And honestly, while I was writing it, I was crying while writing it because I was going back to that place. And one of the stories I tell in the book was a real story that my grandma would tell me. I say that the character's grandma used to tell him about being a nurse at the Huntsville prison. And uh, come to find out, you had a family member that uh, was at Huntsville, but on the other side. <laughs> on the, he, he was uh, a permanent resident, let's just say. I, yeah. I tell people, yeah, my, my uncle works for the state. And they're like, really? I said, yeah, he's got a permanent position there in Huntsville <laughs> in the jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm fl I'm gonna flip this interview on you, and you you can say no if you don't want to talk about it. Are you willing to say what, like how he ended up there? Or no, you know I I've asked my my mother. Uh, my my father's passed away, but I asked my mother one day, why was Uncle Clifford in prison? Because he'd been in more than out, but he was in and out of there for as long as I could remember. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I was a little kid in the 70s, and I, I remember him being there most of the 70s, and I saw him a little bit in the 80s, and he was back in there. It's like, Mom, why is he in there? She said, I don't know. I don't know if she just 
didn't want to tell me or she honestly didn't know. But, uh, wow. That's even, yeah. that's kind of interesting that you don't even know why, why he was there. That's crazy. So there's a part in this book where, um, the, and I'll tell the story here because uh, my grandma used to tell me about this guy who called himself the baddest man in Texas. Hmm. And um, she had said that he would kill somebody every time he was going to, he, he was on death row. And every time he was about to get executed, he would kill somebody. So he would go back on trial and then it would delay his, his execution. Um, the only thing I know about him, the only like characteristic, I don't know his name. He was African-American. I do know that. Um, but they had this encounter once where, um, you know, I said, did you ever talk to him? And she said, one time they were moving him and uh, he, he, my grandma was in the way somehow. And he said, get the hell out of my way. And so she moved and got out of his way, but it was scary. And as a kid, that story used to like be so intriguing and exciting and also scary at the same time. My, my grandma actually moved to Nebraska her last uh, few years of her life, which is cool. Uh, but I write about that in the book and I'll, I'll make an offer too, by the way, if anybody can tell me who that guy was, again, he called himself the baddest man in Texas, killed a bunch of people in the prison, and he was African-American. Those are the only details I know about the guy. But if you can provide me with a name or something, and if I can look up and verify it, like, I'll send you a copy of the book signed or, you know, something, because I am I really, I, I can't find who this guy is, and um, I would love to know more about him. I might have to start asking around. I think... I think that um there's somebody that's friends with our family that knows more about huntsville i'm not 100 percent on that but i know there's somebody within my my giant circle uh that knows more about huntsville i'm, I'm gonna ask around i'm gonna i'm gonna find out something Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, let, definitely let me know. I mean, it's like I said, it's been something that's kind of fascinated me. And I don't know if my grand, my, I think I might have even asked my grandma what his name was, and she may not have remembered by that point. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, um, I'm definitely intrigued. And I hope that I hope, um, I hope a lot of people read this book. And I hope that um, if a lot of people do read it, somebody can provide me with that information, because that would really mean a lot to me. So, <laughs> so if you don't mind me asking, how much is the book? So you can get it on Amazon for twelve ninety nine, and then I think I put it for uh, six ninety nine um, on the uh, Kindle edition. So um, after printing costs, things like that, um, I make a few dollars on it. But that was another thing I had to realize with this book. Like when I put my album out, um, my rock, my 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 um, hard rock album, I had like. I had a really good like promotional circuit go through that I had a lot of press. I had um, a huge radio guy in Canada, um, you know, post about it um, just from hard work, from reaching out, from trying different, you know, creative marketing things. I had radio play. Um, I had Cameron Haynes, uh, one of like Joe Rogan's like best friend with millions of followers posted it. Uh, wow. Just all kinds of stuff. Right. And none of that stuff hardly made a drop in the bucket. So I realized with this book, like, if I think I'm going to get rich off of this with, you know, how hard I tried that, I mean, that was like some of the hardest work I've ever done and, you know, whatever I'm still, you know, uh, still, still in Nebraska. And, and, uh, but, but anyway, um, I, I just kind of realized like, look, I'm probably not going to get rich off this book. So, you know, make it affordable for people and uh, try to get as many people to write it and, and just entertain some people. And, and hopefully too, by the way, I hope that people who suffer from sleep paralysis will read it and they're going to read my take on how to cure it. And I hope that they try it. You know, um, what I wrote as, um, as a potential cure and cures, cause, cause the character tries a lot of different things in the book, um, a lot, you know, um, and I hope people, uh, I hope it helps people too, actually. Well, I'll tell you what, if somebody out there that's either listening to this or watching it and you can, tell us who that guy was that he's talking about in the prison uh, email me uh, i don't know if you want me to put your email up on on That's the description fine. but um I'll, I'll put both of our emails email one of us you you let us know who it is if we can verify that i will buy the book for him hey that's awesome I tell you what, too, if anybody listens to this and they don't like what they said and they want to uh, leave a negative comment do the same thing email both of us so we can 
if you're yeah. if you're gonna complain about anything in the episode, please email us both on the email so Kyle and I can have the shared experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know what? It's good to get some negative feedback because that helps me to improve and be better. Because yeah. I want this to be the best that it can be. Yeah. You know, I already suffer from stuttering and and uh, which i mean i'm a lot better than what i was as a kid but my, my oh, brain wow. kind of out thinks my mouth so it tries to catch up yeah <laughs> and um you know i, I have a sorry I, I probably am boring people out there because they've heard this a million times but I, I suffer from a disease in my spine which makes my bones deteriorate huh. and uh but i'm I'm not complaining because it's opened yeah. up doors for me and it's allowed me to do this full time. And I'm, I get to meet people like you and so many incredible folks. So it's, it's, it's all worked out, but wow. I, you know, I, I know that I screw up and I sometimes will edit it out. Sometimes I leave it in just to see if somebody is going to say something. Yeah. I want, I want to know that feedback. I want to be better. I want to do the best that I can. And I'm, I'm thick skinned enough. You can call me, you know, uh, a male rooster or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't bother me. Yeah. I, uh, sometimes, some, sometimes like insults though, can be funny. Like there are certain things where like a guy's kind of like upsetting me, but then they'll just like cross a line where it's like, honestly, this guy's starting to become funny. Like I've, I've had that too, where it's like, initially you're like starting to feel bad, but then you're like, this is pretty outrageous. This is like professional wrestling, which again, I would actually say politics is heavily like professional wrestling, right? Most of those people are friends behind the scenes. <laughs> so yeah, so, they, yeah. they really are. I, I've interviewed a couple of wrestlers and it's quite funny. The, uh, the stories that I've heard, but yet when I get some of those uh, weird comments, like I mentioned before, I, yeah. I chuckle. I, I really do. And it actually motivates me even more because I think if somebody took the time to tell me they didn't like me, then at least somebody watched it. No and, kidding. And, and I was significant enough to them that they decided to post a comment. Y yeah. You know what? Um, uh yeah, I, and I highly agree with that too. I mean, you you have to, you kind of get nerve. Like when I'm doing rounds of like a book like this, and everybody's like telling me it's good, it kind of freaks me out. And when I had this cover come out and I showed it to somebody and they didn't like it, I got really bummed out. And then I was thinking, I said, if you would have told me yesterday, hey, your graphic uh, designer is going to send you the cover, and some people are going to love it, and some people are going to hate it, or everybody's going to think it's okay. I would have chose the love it or hate it. Love it or hate it has always sold more, even in the yeah. beer industry, man. Like if some people loved it and some people hated it, that product was just going to sell more. So, you know, you definitely need that because if everybody's just telling you everything's okay, then it's not, you know, you probably have room to do better. But um, I was going to ask you too, have you ever yeah. heard of a guy named uh, Dr. Michael Heiser? Dr. Michael Heiser, just not ringing a bell at the moment. I think he would be right up your alley. I don't know, you know, he may, or if you tried to do an interview with him, he may or may not. I've tried to interview him before and um, I never heard back from him, <laughs> but, but uh, he, he's written, um, he's written a book. He's like a biblical scholar, but he like really dives into the book of Enoch. And Ooh. he talks about like stuff that um, like other people don't, like some Christians don't really agree with some of his takes, but he's got a book called like the unseen realm. And um He's got just uh, honestly, like people should go on Amazon, look at the title of his, of his books. He's got one book called Demons. Um, but like when I was listening to your interview with uh, Hugh Newman, like um, I kind of have a theory on giants myself. I think that to me, it's kind of clear in like the in the Old Testament that like um, there were giants. It seems like maybe the fallen angels were mating with humans and that was it. kind of a hybrid offspring. And so like, one of the things that like Heiser kind of points to, I feel if I'm remembering or if I'm quoting him correctly, is like basically a lot of those Greek gods like Hercules and things like that, there probably were like these weird half breed, half fallen angel, half humans that were able to do amazing things like mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of the point of the flood was to wipe them out. Um, now, whether like Goliath was one of those and was still around, I don't know. I don't understand that, but 
Um, I think that there's definitely room for that. Um, the Bible, honestly, like when you, there's so many small things that if you miss it, especially with the old Testament, it just becomes so much more fascinating. Like in the book of Job, they kind of mentioned dinosaurs, which again, like I pointed that out to my dad my dad's like, geez, I've been reading the Bible like twice a year for 30 years. And I never even picked that up. Wow. <laughs> you know? Oh, you're going to have to share that with me because I, I don't remember reading about that. In the book of Job here, I'll tell you right now. Let's see. Uh, book of Job. And by the way, have you read the book of Enoch? No, I have not. But um, and I, I want to. It. Do you have it? Yes. When I, I used to watch ancient aliens, like religiously, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, <me too>. yeah. <laughs> but um, they mentioned it and I, I looked it up on, I think it was Amazon and bought mm -hmm. it it's a very fascinating book to say the least and makes you think there are aliens uh yeah i've like heiser goes really deep into that which i think you would i mean even knowing that i think you would find it you know that much more um fascinating um maybe it was job's behemoth i'm trying to find it here at a quick glance um but they basically mentioned like uh here we go job, job 40 15 through 24 um i believe if that's the right verse i'm thinking of if you go through there it kind of sounds like they're talking about dinosaurs um and then i think it's in duno it's i think it's deuteronomy where they talk about like the angels kind of like having a half breed race where fallen angels were you know mating with with humans mm -hmm. um but again the old testament is obviously harder to understand for a lot of different ways, but um, it's very easy to read past that stuff. But if you actually stop and think about it, it's crazy. And there's also like Christian theories on stuff like the pre Adamite race. Have you ever, have you ever read about that? No, I haven't. I would love to read something about that though. So the pre Adamite race um, is basic. There's like a theory out there and I don't know if this is the exact theory, but it's like similar, I think, which is like, the thought is, is that maybe when Satan was cast out of heaven, he had like a reign on earth for a certain amount of time. And that's why when we dig up like prehistoric stuff, they have like these weird, you know, skulls and we see these weird creatures. The thought process is, is that maybe Satan had created some stuff himself. Um, it's a theory. It's not, you know, um, it, it's not like a probably a Christian belief that even a whole lot of people believe, but there are Christians who definitely believe that. Um, so that's, that's interesting too. There, there's a lot more, there's a lot more to it than that. Like if you really, you know, uh, do research on it, you'd be surprised at, at what you find with the Bible. Well, you have to question because if you read the old Testament after God created Adam and Eve, and then the, mm -hmm. they had their sons and they took wives from a tribe of people. Well, did he go out and, and make, a uh, a whole tribe of people out of clay or did they come from somewhere else yeah yeah I, I had a co-worker once who i was like i said you can ask me any question in the bible and i'll see if i know the answer to it she's like okay cool um so like where did all the other people come from because like with cain and abel there was like other people on earth were they all adam and eve's kids and i was like don't know the answer to that one Definitely <laughs> <don't know. laughs> like, it is a good question i, I don't it, think i've ever talked to anybody about that it is there's like a really cool website called like uh let me see if i can find it like biblical questions answered if you type in that like uh biblical questions answered like you can go down some cool rabbit holes but i think <laughs> like um I'm, I'm looking it up right now but there's um I really think like some people that you would dive pr probably pretty deep into that would like kind of blow your mind. It's called gotquestions.org, gotquestions.org. They cover like a variety of things. So like weird random subjects to, you know, mainstream Christianity. But like another guy is Stephen Bancars. He wrote a book. I'll send, I'll send you links to him. So like Stephen Bancars and Dr. Michael Heiser, are like, Stephen Bancars is a couple of years older than me. And then Dr. Michael Heiser is like, 50s or 60s but they've got videos together and they talk about you know what would be considered like fringe christianity 
And then um, there's some guys at like Apology at Baptist Church. So it's like a Baptist church, but like they do all kinds of different programs where they talk about some, you know, aliens. They have a show called Cultish where they talk about that stuff. So if people want to know, like there's a lot of Christians that bury their heads in the sand and they don't want to answer questions that should be answered, like aliens and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I like the people that aren't afraid to just dive into that and to say, I don't know. You know, um, there's that one guy in the Bible where Jesus is like, I'll heal your daughter if you believe. And he says, I believe, help me in my unbelief. And what what that shows is like, it's okay to have doubts. You know what I mean? And, and one thing that changed in my life was I used to avoid doubts. I used to avoid ancient aliens because I was afraid, like, what if I watch an episode and then I stop believing in God? And then I just said, no, that's dumb. I'm just going to dive head first into it. And I'm going to see, you know, I'm going to find answers. And, and I've always been able to find an answer that's, you know, made me feel better about whatever. But so I, I like those guys, you know, Paul Gia Church, Michael Heiser, Stephen Bancars. They definitely don't always agree. I don't always agree with with them, but it's uh, it's intriguing. Definitely. I, I don't know how deep you got into looking at my videos, but yeah, I've interviewed uh, Jan Harzen and he is the uh, director of MUFON. Okay. I've had uh, Robert Clotworthy, who is the, the voice of ancient aliens. So if you, yeah. you know, <laughs> yes. you hear him always talking, I had him on the show. Incredible guy, by the way. Yeah. And, and uh, Carolyn Corey and a few others. I've got a, a I got some more people from the show that's coming on soon. Uh, Michael Denon, I think he's he's an author and he's a scholar. Apparently, uh, I only thought he was coming on. And when I got the email confirming, there was about four or five other people who was part of it. I'm like, oh, uh, are they coming on too or what? But that's going to be interesting. Yeah, that's fun. Just I'm going to tell you my like most embarrassing moment, like, um, and this will probably make your skin crawl as a podcaster. I did an interview with a dude and I didn't hit record and we did the whole interview. And, um, the next day I told my, I'm like, told my buddy, who's kind of like my producer. I'm like, dude, I can't find the interview. And we're looking through it. And I sent this guy the wrong podcast link and the link that I sent him didn't automatically record. And the one I usually do does. And so I didn't record the interview. So I still put him on the website. I just put him as for his book recommendations. And I tried to do like quotes that I remembered. And I feel so bad because he's such a nice guy, but his name's David Carbello. Um, again, he's on, he's on Book Brilliant. You can read it, but like he is a legit archaeologist. Like he he works at um he he's like works at a college. He's a professor of anthropology, archaeology, and Latin American studies at Boston University. And he basically spends his like summers and time off like in Mexico, like um like digging stuff up or whatever. So like as legit as they come. And uh, I asked him about ancient aliens and he rolled his eyes so hard and he said like some of that stuff is so taken out of context, like the one of like the guy who looks like he's in a spaceship, you know what I'm talking about? Yep. He I know exactly like, about. Yeah. He's like, that's like, he basically said, like, if you look at the full picture and you actually understand it, that's, it's like not even remotely close, but um, you should, uh, you should have him on too, like as a good counter, right? Like to have like the, the guys that are totally for it. And then the guys like him are against it. He, I don't know, maybe, maybe that he wouldn't want to do an interview just on that because like he really focuses on like, he focuses basically on like the parts of like that ancient Mesoamerica that like we would never think of. Like he'll tell you about like their human rights and like how like they're farming. Like it's probably the stuff that most people think is kind of boring, you know, is kind of like what he's into. But he's a very nice guy and has a lot of patience for putting up with me and my mistake. <laughs> I've actually done that once where I went through a whole interview, forgot to hit record. That was my fault. Ooh. And then there was one interview that I did that this, it basically kind of turned out like this guy was doing an infomercial or something. And are you familiar with NFTs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about NFTs. So I thought this guy was coming on to talk about his music career. Cause he was, a, he was a producer or something. And I was all excited for that because he yeah. had worked with some incredible people. And then he just wanted to talk about NFTs. And I, I said, well, how does that work? 
And, and he's like, well, you know, I, I have a digital picture and somebody can buy it. And I said, well, what would stop somebody from just doing a screenshot and stealing the picture? Well, that would be illegal. And I'm like, but if they wanted the picture bad enough, they could just steal it and, you know, keep yeah. it from. So who's going to know? And yeah. I, I just told him that it didn't record because I just didn't want to deal with it. That's funny. Yeah, he's listening to this episode right now. <laughs> he's, you, he's cussing me right now. <laughs> yeah, man, I had um, I interviewed the art Alex Sakis from Everclear, and Everclear is like probably I got to meet him too, like in person. Uh, Brendan from Weedus and I kind of hit it off, and they were on tour with Everclear, and so I gotta I gotta meet him. That was cool, but. Uh, when I met Art though, dude, I, or when I interviewed him, like I was listening to all these interviews and he was, it, they all went like super smooth. And then like the day before I interviewed him, there was like this interview where like the interviewer just was like bringing up stuff he really shouldn't have brought up and stuff. And like Art kind of like, he was polite about it, but kind of was like, hey, no, we're not going to talk about that. And then it like made me super nervous to like talk to him. I was afraid, like, what if he gets mad at me? And he wasn't. He was like one of the nicest guys I've talked to. Super, super cool dude. Um, and he was cool in person, too. But um, I don't know if you've ever had that where it's like, oh, no, I'm afraid that <laughs> I'm afraid this guy's going to get mad. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I've pissed off a couple of people and there's times I wonder my line of questioning wasn't out of line for them. I'm not a controversial person. I try yeah. to I try to find out something that you normally wouldn't hear in an interview. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, I, I had Rudy Sarzo on the show and I know of people that listen to this all the time. have heard this story a million times, but, you know. I already know you're in, you've been in Quiet Riot, you played with Ozzy, you played with White Snake, you know, all these different things. And that's wonderful. But what's what's there about you that we don't know? Because, dude, I can get on YouTube and look up, uh, you know, Rudy Sarzo interview. And I guarantee you, he's answered the same question in each one of those interviews. Yeah, I wanted something different. Yeah, and uh, he talked about his family migrating here from Cuba and the things that they, wow. you know, they did to become citizens. And but I, I, I've asked questions of people that you could tell by the look on their face they didn't want to answer the question. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know how to do it. Like with my 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 podcast is all about like book recommendations, and so you know I basically can say what's your favorite book? You know what's a book that's helped you. I don't know how I would interview a musician without that crutch to lean on because the book, a lot of the times we may not even talk about books, but we talk about other stuff based off of the, you know, based off of it. Like when I was talking to Josh Todd from Buck Cherry, he's telling me how his like best friend or one of his friends as a kid helped find the, the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. Ooh. He was like friends with the kid that help find him. Like Josh Todd is like really into like um, crime, like thriller novels or whatever. Right. And so um, we talked about, you know, a lot of that stuff, but the, you know, using the book was like a good crutch to do it. If I would just had like a, a music podcast, like for one, you're probably not going to get the big guys. Like Mike from Nickelback probably never would have, he wouldn't have been on my podcast if we didn't talk about books, but he would, he, he says like, I liked I like these interviews because it's about something different you know it's so painful to like a lot of the times like when i go to interview somebody i like to listen to all the interviews i can possibly find on them so i don't ask the same questions and some of those some podcasts man are just brutal because there's there's no difference in the line of questioning from one to the next so exactly i applaud you for that yeah yeah or they always want to bring up something real controversial that happened uh, with like take uh, Jack Russell from Great White, okay? Yeah. Great singer. I'm sure he's got wonderful stories, but everybody wants to focus on when they were in that nightclub and it caught on fire. Yeah. It's, I don't want to talk about that stuff. You know, what, what are your hobbies? What do you like to do outside of, of your music? And they get relaxed and they're more open to talk. Cause you know, when you ask the same questions, they usually try to answer them real quick and it's over with when you yeah. find something outside of it, that they, they're like, Oh man, yeah, I'd like to talk about this. Uh, and then all of a sudden they're, they're talking more and it's a better interview. 
Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you like what, like um, I'm friends with, uh, and I'm not trying to name drop or whatever, but I, I was debating about saying his name, but then I realized he's on the back of the book. Um, Mitch McVicker, Christian music artist, he did the, he did the blurb for the back of my book. Right. And um, people may or may not know him, but he was in a car accident with Rich Mullins. Rich wrote that song, Our God is an Awesome God. Like that was Rich's song. Um, Mitch was in the car accident with Rich that killed Rich. And so it's, it's kind of like the great white thing, man. Like I feel bad because people like that's all they want to talk about. And like props to Mitch, like he's told me before, like he really doesn't mind it. And I actually believe that. Like I, I actually believe he doesn't mind it because he loves Rich so much that like um, he anything that he can do to keep his friend's memory out there, he's willing to do. But like, man, like I wouldn't want, you know, if my best friend and I were in something and he died, like I wouldn't want that to be what every interview I do is talked about. Every new person yeah. I meet is like, man, it's so sad what happened. You know what I mean? And like, that's like his life, but he, I mean, he, like I said, he embraces it and he's just like, you know, yeah, I was the other guy in the Jeep and, um, you know, I love Rich and um, he loves keeping his memory alive. So, um, so yeah, I definitely, I, I get what you're saying there. And uh, I'll probably be labeled the worst interviewer in the world, but I will ask them straight up before we hit the record button. Is there anything you don't want to talk about? Let me know and I'll avoid it altogether. Cause, oh, um, I'm kind of like, yeah, I, yeah. so I did, um, I did like a podcast or I did like an on book brilliant. I did a thing called like between the lines and it's like, um, I talked to the guys over the phone. I've only done two of them, but I talked to him over the phone and then I like edit out like, it's like a written, it's just kind of like an old school kind of interview you'd read in a magazine. And I heavily edit that. And like, I'll edit something in the podcast too. Like, um, if, if, if somebody, if we were to get into something and they didn't want to talk about it, like I'll edit it because I'm not here to, like, I'm not here for clickbait and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like that to me feels pretty dirty. So, um, you know, if somebody's like, says, you know, Hey, I'm sorry. I, I said, that, like, I've had guests say like, I said a guy's name there. Can you take that out? Like, I don't think you'd appreciate that. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. I'll go and edit it. Like, that's not what I'm here. You listen to my interviews, you listen to your interviews, like you're still going to walk away, learn something new about the person, but yeah. you don't have to like do it at their expense. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's the thing, like mainstream, I like guess your Rolling Stone or, you know, whatever, uh, entertainment tonight, whatever, they'll dig into the dirty stuff and yeah. basically make this guy feel like crap where I want them to feel comfortable and I'm, I'll be honest with you, and I'm not trying to brag here, but I, I have interviewed some guys that when it's over, they're like, thank you. I was able to talk about something different, and yeah. I really enjoyed talking about this. And you could tell that they were really, really happy about it. And then before we're done, they're like, hey, man, here's my number. Give me a call sometime. I'm like, yeah, that's an honor. It is. I know exactly. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And it stinks too, because like, like I said, a lot of people do it at their expense. Um, real recently, I, I realized like somebody who actually reads a lot is the, is Violent J from the Insane Clown Posse. Oh yeah. And I thought, I was like, dude, that would be an insane interview. Like to get that guy talking about books. Cause like when, when Mike from Nickelback came on my show, like people were writing blogs about it. Cause he had said like, one of the first things he said was I've read all of Shakespeare. I've read all the classics and people were like, "Whoa!" like the guy from Nickelback, you know what I mean? And so I found out that like Violent J likes to read a lot. And I, I'm not saying he's reading Shakespeare in the classics, but he likes to read books. And I thought like, dude, that would be a cool, that'd be a really different side of him, you know? Yeah. So I reached out to his, his agent who I know is his PR agent. And I was like, I please let me interview him. And she's like, sorry, he, he does no, he does no press. And it sucks because people have sat there and they've, you know, who, who knows what it, you know, people have tried to make not just the, not just ICP, but, you know, sometimes these artists, um, maybe they feel comfortable. So they'll share something that they, you know, they're trying to explain something. So they say like, well, this is what I mean. And they don't mean that to be public and it gets out there and then it's out of context. It sounds really bad. I've had that happen to me. 
like I did an interview where I, when I was, when I was running for city council and I, I made a really dumb comparison. It was a very dumb comparison and my friends all made fun of me for it. And it was one of those moments of like, man, I, I now, now I know what it's like to say something like to like, even, even in context, it still sounds stupid, but you, you looking back, you're like, I really regret saying that, you know, and I don't want to make someone else feel like that. So um, I tamper my stuff down a, a little bit, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that. Well, maybe we can exchange, uh, a, you know, talk about people that maybe you could interview and vice versa when yeah. this is done. That'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that would definitely be cool. I'll, I'll think of some people here, um, you know, uh, who are, who are still doing, uh, you, you, have you ever had to, where it's just like the right timing of things, you know, where it's like, um, like I'll have people I'll reach out to and they'll say like, okay, come back in a year and he'll do it. And it's like, well, geez, you know, you're trying to set a reminder or whatever. So, um, some of my guests, um, you know, I got lucky with, but I can still try to help, you know, I'll, I'll try to help you bridge that gap, but, um, there's no guarantee. There's no guarantees. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. I, I'll definitely try, but yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. That'd be cool. You need to have JJ French on your show. JJ French. Who, who's he with? He's the guitar player for twisted sister. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He, he just uh, wrote a book and he's trying to, to promote it. And uh, that's what I had him on my show for is to talk about the, the book. And uh, he, yeah, he'd be great. I'm almost positive. He would come on and talk about it because I've recommended him to somebody else that uh, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested. So I could, I could email him and ask him. Yeah, that would be cool. I'll tell you that for that reminded me of something. This is kind of a crazy story. Maybe it's not crazy to some people, but um, so the guitarist from Mr. Mister is from where I'm from, Fremont, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And so he, I knew, I worked with this guy who was like a huge fan and he knew like th this guy that I knew, his parents were friends with the guitarist from Mr. Mister's parents. And so he knew like where, where their house was at in, in town. And so one day he's driving down the street and he saw the, the guitarist standing there in the driveway. So he like pulled over and was like, he ran up and he said, Hey, um, he said his name. He said, you know, these are my parents. And the guy's like, okay, cool. And so they just sat there and talked for a little bit, you know, just talking about family and stuff. And he said that while they're talking, there is this guy fumbling around in the garage and my friend, you know, wasn't really paying attention. And so as they're talking, the guy comes out of the garage and walks by and it was Ted Nugent. No. And yeah. And my friend was like, and just like, didn't even like know what to even say, but like it, they were going fishing together. And uh, yeah, like Ted was, <laughs> Ted yeah. was in my hometown uh, fumbling around and uh, yeah. But ironically though, Ted Nugent was the first celebrity I've ever met when I was maybe not even six months old. My dad went to like a bow hunting convention and brought me along and uh, uh, Ted Nugent was <laughs> was my first celebrity encounter but yeah, yeah i just thought that i've always thought that was a crazy story <laughs> yeah he lives up in north texas yeah he i think that dude have you tried reaching out to him to get him on i would love to yeah i i, I say i try to avoid politics but i have a feeling that's exactly where it would go to if i had ted on <laughs> yeah dude you get ted on it's basically going to be you hitting record and and you just let him take over <laughs> i'd be like this yeah go ahead man Whatever you got to say. I have had some people come on and I, I ask the first question and then that's it. I just sit here the rest of the time listening. That's cool. You know, it makes my job easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Dude, I do the opposite though, like on my podcast. Like sometimes I really feel like I run people down or uh, I had Jack Deer on who was, who's like my favorite author. And I had spent like five years trying to get in contact with him just to interview him or do something for the book or for my website. And when I finally got him on the show, I was so nervous that I start every question by saying, hey, I wanted to ask you. And it's so annoying to listen to because he does like say he shares a lot of stuff that he hasn't shared like in other interviews and stuff. But like, it's so annoying to hear myself. Hey, I wanted to ask you, Hey, mm. I wanted to ask you. And it was because like the whole time I was just super nervous. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. There's, there's been times I, you know, I, I don't get really starstruck, but when I have someone on that, I really, really admire 
sometimes I'm, I'm thinking of so many things I want to ask that I fumble over my words and, and yeah. I sound very repetitive. It's kind of boring. Sometimes yeah. I have to go back and take out a lot of stuff. I find myself going and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, I know that's annoying. It annoys me when I'm doing the editing. Yeah. <laughs> do you, do you like write out questions to ask people or no? Sometimes I will. Yeah. But most of the time the conversation pretty much flows. I, yeah. when I first started, you know, I got this stupid book that says that, you know, how to be a podcaster. Mm -hmm. I read the book and I did everything the book said, you know, make sure you write out all your questions. And what I would do is as soon as I ask that first question, I'm waiting for that pause so I can yeah. ask the next question. Correct. And then not realize sometimes that they've already answered the question before I asked it. Yeah. And besides it sounds so robotic. I like doing the conversations because it's, it sounds natural. Yeah. Yeah. I, I try to do a hybrid of that. Like um, I write them down because I'll forget like in the moment, like I, I just know, like I'll have something and then afterwards I'll be like, Oh man. But like, um, you know, my first few interviews, I would write out like three pages of question. Cause I really like the, the author, like Neil Strauss. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he wrote for like Rolling Stones. He's the one who did the bi the biographies or the autobiographies for Marilyn Manson, Motley Crue, Dave Navarro. He was like oh, wow. the guy that compiled that. And like his thing, I follow it too, like as much as I can, like he goes and he reads everything that they've ever, like an artist has put out. If he's going to interview him, he listens to every song. He listens to every interview, every artistic thing they've done. And so he needs like six months to do, to do that. Well, a lot of the times with me, I have maybe a week or two weeks before I go and interview somebody. And so usually I can listen to all the songs. If it's a music artist, um, I try to read the book. If it's an author, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, which I think that, you know, you, you absolutely um, have to do that. But, you know, some of those, for, sometimes like I'll have a guy on and I'll, I'll have three pages of, of notes that I'm, I can't get to all of them, you know, but uh, you know, and, and then sometimes too, you find things that you never thought to ask, but it's like a fascinating topic, you mm -hmm. know, like Josh Todd talking about serial killers, like, geez, like that's pretty, you know, that's interesting. Yeah, of course. Well, I know a lot of authors. So if, uh, if you want me to hook you up with them, I'm more than happy to. Yeah, I'm at a weird point right now with it where, um, uh, you know, with with this coming out, I'm kind of going on a podcast circuit with it. So I'm definitely very interested in it. I'm not doing interviews really right now, like, um, you know, at the, at the moment, but um, I will definitely take a peek at that list because, uh, um, you know, when I'm ready to pick up my own podcast again. But like I said, with this book coming out and with some of the acting stuff I've been doing, I don't really know what's next. I've got other book ideas. Um, but at the same time, like, um, I'm very, I've written some scripts and, um, um, I don't know if I'm, if I'm ready to say it or not, but I'm going to, I'll announce this here with, with you, this quote unquote announcement, but, um, this book kind of started off as a script initially. And, um, I really believe that I can get it made into a movie. And um, so that's going to be kind of my next focus. So uh, we'll see what happens there. <laughs> well, I, I wish all the best for you, man. I don't want to say good luck. I'll say break a leg. Yeah, there we go. I, <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, um, if people want to stay in touch, you know, um, mattbechtel.net, uh, my website. Um, from there, my email's on there, um, you know, mattbechtel4 at gmail.com. Um, on Instagram, I'm Matt Bechtel on Facebook. I'm Matt Bechtel creative. All those links are on, uh, on my website, but you know, um, and then bookbrilliant.com. If you're intrigued by the podcast I'm talking about, and then always tyrants.com. If you're intrigued by, by the movie. Um, so I don't know, Jack of all trades, master of none, but I feel like <laughs> all creative things feed into each other. People are telling me, you know, you got to pick one. You really got to pick one. It's like, Why? I don't, I don't really buy into that because the, the writing I do feeds into the acting and, and, and stuff. Um, all of that fits into the music. The music feeds that, you know, being able to play on stage has greatly helped me be able to perform on camera. 
And, and then it provides me with content to do with my website. And then in my day-to-day -day life, it helps me with conversations, you know, um, you know, it's, it's whether it's um, people asking me about it or me really trying to find out what the most interesting thing is about a person. And then learning that helps me with, you know, writing or a role I'm doing or a song I'm trying to write, whatever. I believe it all feeds together. So you know, a creative person, you'll find that they get into all kinds of different stuff. Yeah. And then you'll go through this period where you're more focused on one thing than you are another. Yeah. So I just say, go with the flow, man, whatever you're feeling at that moment. And that might be the time that, that God is telling you, this is what you need to focus on. Yeah. So just go with that. I, I wouldn't worry about what everybody else says. Think outside <laughs> the box anyway. It's boring to think that we're all robots and we have to do everything like this all the time. No, yeah. you don't. You don't have to. No, who says that you have to? Where's the rule yeah. book that says you have to? Yeah, no, I com I completely agree. So, but Kyle, I, I really appreciate you having me on. This was a, a really fun conversation. And um, again, I, I can't thank you enough for it. Oh, yeah. I appreciate your time. I know time is precious. And I also want to thank all of you out there. If uh, you happen by the channel, I appreciate you stopping by and I hope you'll come back. Hit that subscribe button. If you are a regular, thank you for that support. It's because of you that I get to do this. So until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.